Feed the Bridge listeners, how are you? Well, it's me again, Lauren C. Brown, the senior producer of the Be the Bridge podcast. I guess I won't be hiding behind the scenes anymore. I might be a regular and you might be hearing my voice a little bit more. So today I would like to share with you another podcast. If you know anything about Be The Bridge, you know that we like to equip and share other resources outside of our own. We feel like it's always great to be learners. And so today I'm going to share with you another podcast. It's Human Hope with Carlos Whitaker. Carlos Whitaker is an author, speaker, moment maker, spider killer, and hope dealer, People's Choice Award winner, a former recording artist signed to a major label, a social media maven. He currently spends the majority of his time writing books and speaking on stages around the world. In a time where humanity is desperate to find hope, Carlos Whitaker leads us into conversations that bring us just that. From fun discussions about everyday joy to polarizing and challenging topics, Carlos shows even the most hardened heart that there is still hope in humanity. Carlos's episodes are released every Thursday on a That Sounds Fun Network. For more information on Carlos, follow him on Instagram at Lowswit and visit carloswhitaker.com. Now let's take it to the bridge. Be the bridge, be the bridge. You are listening to the Be the Bridge podcast with Latasha Morrison. How are you guys doing today? It's exciting. Each week, Be the Bridge podcast tackles subjects related to race and culture with the goal of bringing understanding. But I'm going to do it in the spirit of love. We believe understanding can move us toward racial healing, racial equity, and racial unity. Latasha Morrison is the founder of Be The Bridge, which is an organization responding to racial brokenness and systemic injustice in our world. This podcast is an extension of our vision to make sure people are no longer conditioned by a racialized society, but grounded in truth. If you have not hit the subscribe button, please do so now. Without further ado, let's begin today's podcast. Oh, and stick around for some important information at the end. Be the Bridge family. Listen, I am so excited. You know, I'm always excited when I have someone on here. So every time you hear me say I'm so excited, it's like I'm really so excited. It's a part of my intro, but I'm really excited to have Marcy Walker here today with us and I just want to tell you a little bit about her and then we'll talk about how we even met. Marcy Alvis Walker is the creator of the popular Instagram feed um, Black Coffee with White Friends. So we got to talk about how that name came about. She's also the creator of Black Eyed Bible Studies. Marcy is passionate about what it means to embrace intersexuality, diversity and inclusion in our spiritual lives. She lives in Chicago with her husband, her college age age kid, Max, and their dog, Evie. Okay, I think I met Evie, so. (laughs) Yeah, Evie is. I am so grateful Mm -hmm. to have you here. It's so good to have you here. Now, we got to go back because I I, I barely can make it through your, um, your bio without saying, Listen, we met each other probably in 20... It was before or maybe right after... I think it was during Trump's campaigning. It was... No, we met way before that. We met like... But our lunch was during that time. Yeah. Okay, so so we had to meet in 2015 or 2014? Maybe 2014. I think it was like 2014... Because I moved to Austin, Texas in 2012. We met either 2014 or 2013, somewhere in that. But all I know is we met in Austin, Texas mm-hmm. and all and all the things. And then I know we didn't live far from each other. We no. stayed mm-hmm. near each other. Um, we met um, through a conversation um, a, a, about um, um, Max in school in um, Austin Mm -hmm. and it was about uh, I think it was some project and so I I remember some of that and then like the next thing I know 
it was like you you were in a be the bridge group so let you you tell me you reference to me how how do we met tell the people how we met and all all the things <laughs> i'm probably jacking everything up no you, you got it pretty right um so i was in austin and okay. i was in the sunken place and <laughs> I was was at the second place. What's the second place? (laughs) So the second place. (laughs) I was at this Christian academy. I was this. I was the only black mom at this Christian academy, and you were teach. You were doing. You had a job at the church where that school had its campus. Okay. okay. So I was going to the, our kids was at the school. You had just gotten a job okay. at this yeah. church and you were running their children's ministry, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. um, but I was really in the sunken place, but not in the way where I didn't know that I was in the sunken place. I was in the sunken place, not knowing how to get out of it because Austin, I come from Chicago. I well, first I came from Ohio, Cleveland area, and I had lots of family. I had black community. I had, you know, like I, I just had a lot of things. I also um, had moved to Chicago. I, I have been married to a black man and then we divorced uh-huh. and I still had black community. I had a lot of black girlfriends. It wasn't hard to see black people or meet black people. And then I moved to Austin and I would go. We were scarce. <laughs> scarce. Like I could go months. Yeah. And not week. see. Yeah. Yeah. Not see another black person. Not see anyone but my own child and my own reflection. <laughs> and I was married. And it's funny because I married this white guy um, who I'm still married to, my, the love of my life. And he was, uh-huh. it was so funny because he kept saying when we were dating, are you sure you want to give this up? Because I cannot guarantee that we can replicate what you have going on um, right. in Chicago. And I was just like, I was like, that's because you're not black. And when we show up, we turn up and we'll find each other. And don't you worry. <laughs> And I really did think I would just get there. I'd see someone at the grocery store. We kiki. We get, you know, like I really did think it was as simple as that. Right, right. And so um, I I was in the second place kind of from the get. And then Max, um, we need to find a different school for Max because they were being bullied for being smart. And so I, I said, well, let me put them in a smart place where it's okay for everybody to be an egghead because, you know, yeah. that was never my problem. I was never bullied for being smart because right, right, I was right. not that kid. But Max right, right. was. So I put them there and I was the only black mom. And it was uh-huh. it was astonishing to me. But I have believed that because it was a Christian academy that everybody was aware of my particular struggles or cared, I should say, if, if the, that they cared. I didn't know that my personal battles and struggles were so offensive to them. Mm, mm. And when I was in this class, I was in this like back to school thing and they had these classes that the parents had to take. Like, y'all, it was really something. It was talk about indoctrination. So we had to take these classes. And I was at this back to school event where you had to, there were mandatory things that you had to do. And so I was in this mandatory thing about history. And the head of the history department had announced that my kid at the time was in ninth grade, had announced that in 11th grade, my brown baby, Nada P. Jones' grandchild, was going to have to get up in class and participate in a slave debate and that they were going to have to do both the pros and the cons. And my Ooh, biggest... My, blood oh, blood. my biggest... Like, <laughs> Ooh, so, Ten years later, I'm I still... Know. And, you know, my child is fine. And it's still, like, triggering. So, like... I went home, 
my husband and I, we were really in a tizzy that night. I went home. I put in slave debates and I was astonished to see how many came up. You don't see it so much now because, you know, we've had this whole like reckoning, half reckoning, not reckoning. So schools are a little bit more aware, but I guarantee they will be making a comeback if Ron DeSantis has anything to do with it. So I... I didn't know what to do. And all these people have been saying to me, white women, for like the past few months have been saying, I have this friend named Latasha. You two might like each other. And I was thinking, because I'm in the sunken place and I don't trust anyone. So I'm thinking, oh, you think I might like her because we're both black and that makes me feel like I'm not going to like her because you think I'm going to like her and I don't, and I can't understand but you were the only person and I knew that you ha- were doing be the bridge okay. so I I just started you like you just I think started it I just started like yeah. it wasn't even I don't even think it had a, a full name at that point like, you know, we were calling it Reconciliation Circle, The Circle. We were saying everything. It was like yeah. in the very baby stages, yes. There was, mm-hmm. no, I don't even know if there was a name. The only reason why I knew that you were someone that I might need to reach out to was uh-huh. because you had been part of the If Gathering. Uh huh. And it was your first year, and yep. you sat at the table and you had the little elephant, and I yep. was. <laughs> blew my mind that this conversation was even happening. Right. That's how long ago this was. It yeah. never happened before. Yeah. yeah. And then it wasn't common until then. It like, was not common. No one was really having that no. conversation until then. No. And it just tapped into what so many people were feeling and thinking. And it made a lot of women of color feel seen. And yeah. you know what's so interesting about that, Tasha, is that I think that. It, these conversations were happening with white pastors and black pastors at yeah. maybe they were doing reconciliation things definitely for mm-hmm. Black History Month, definitely for mm-hmm. Dr. King's birthday. Yeah. But women within the church, this was not mm-hmm. happening. And we're the ones at the church all the time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. We're not having that. We're not having yeah. this conversation. And so yeah. I sent you, I think I had your email from another, I can't even remember the woman's name. And uh-huh. no, I emailed your work email. I looked yes, you up. Yes, yes. I emailed you because I already emailed and talked to my sisters. And my sisters okay. are like zero to ratchet. Like that's just how <laughs> they are. So they're ready to get in the car, drive from Ohio, come to, you know, the campus. <laughs> raise a fuss. I'm like, no, I need y'all to sit back. And we're going to bring the smoke. I know. That we're it's like, because we cannot fathom, like, why anyone would think oh. like that. So it's shocking. Oh, my goodness. It's alarming. It's like, mm-hmm. it does. It makes you so right. angry. I always have to use that um, that mm-hmm. that analogy, like, just where in Avengers, mm-hmm where the Hulk takes Loki and slings him and he says you puny he tells you puny human <laughs> like right, exactly. he says you puny god yeah. he says you puny god and he just slams him I was like that's th- the rage that you feel when you hear stuff like this right. um but then it's like you have to come to yourself and like okay wait a minute like like you're in shock and so the shock of it almost paralyzes you it paralyzes you and you don't trust yourself Mm. Because I'm thinking my next move has to both be um, honest, true, and to the point. Uh-huh. But it also has to keep my child safe because my yeah. kid's going to have to... I is the one that's going to have to suffer whatever consequence based on what I say and how I say it. I knew that. Yeah. I knew that. And so... I, emailed you and I think I said you know am I being a little too sensitive about this and I think I got an email from you like two minutes later and you were one (laughs) busy person at that time and two minutes later you were just like um 
no, you are not being too sensitive. And let me tell you why. And it was just so such a relief. And I think the very next day I'm on campus, y'all, I go back to campus, like this thing has happened. I'm setting up meetings with the teacher and the head of the school and I'm on campus. I'm like singing, nobody knows the troubles. <laughs> like I'm just in this place on this campus. I am thinking what has happened Correct. to me? Like I am on this campus. I'm looking at every white face and I'm going, are you for or against? Are you pro or con? Like I, I really didn't know. Right. And our friend Lori Jennings came out of yeah. nowhere like a like a yeah. like a, a like a rainbow and came Person up to me. Person of peace. Yes, piece. to this day. <laughs> yeah. And she grabbed my hands and she said, We got you. I'm gonna yeah. email you. Tasha told me to come and get you. And it was just yeah. I think I wept. I think I cried. It makes me want to cry right now. Yeah. Because yeah. I really was, I was away from my people. I didn't have my family. Yeah. My yeah. husband, God bless, mm-hmm. knew, understood 110%, but also knew I'm a white man. This is something that I yeah. cannot fix for my wife i can't be her voice thank god that he wasn't one of those men where he's gonna go you know tell someone about my experience Mm -hmm. all Mm -hmm. i can do and it was the hardest thing for him he's like all i can do is sit beside her while she speaks Mm -hmm. and validate everything that she's saying which Mm -hmm. is not easy wow that's good when you're you know, used to being someone's ride or die and you want to pop off and get in there. But he's also like, I want my wife to have her own voice mm. because it would be very easy for me to say something and then to suddenly shift the conversation to him because mm. he's, a, he's a white male who's that supposed head of my house, which isn't how we play at my house. But, you know, that's what they would have wanted. But mm-hmm. he... And I was shaking to mm. to say all this. And not because I was afraid to say it. It was because I was afraid I would come undone. And I knew mm. that if I came too emotional in it, mm. they would shut down and they would become emotional. And then I'd be trying to make them feel better and... You know, mm-hmm. it, it, yeah. the whole of the whole. We know every we could write the playbook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you and I went to lunch, I think, later that week and or yeah. later that month. And you said this beautiful thing to me that I have kept. <laughs> I have kept this. I have I've quoted this to my kid. I've quoted this mm-hmm. to other people. And you said, all you can do is tell them the truth. That's mm-hmm. all you can do. That's that. All you can do is tell them the truth. What they do with that truth is on them. Mm-hmm. But all you can do is just tell them the truth. And mm-hmm. and since then, I was just like, all I can do is tell them the truth. That you know, like I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have to fix it. I don't mm-hmm. have to, you know, um, convince them that it's the mm-hmm. truth. All I can do is just state here are the facts. Mm. This is what is true. And what you do with that truth or how you process it is all on you. Mm. And it's how I hope I operate with my my book and even with Black Coffee White Friends and even with um, Black Eyed Stories because I always want to make sure that I'm just like, this is what they said. This is the... This is where that comes from. I can tell you how I feel about it, and you don't have to agree with my feelings, but you can't uh-huh. deny that, you know, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death while he owned b- black yeah. bodies. You can't, right. while he had black bodies yeah. and chains. You yeah. can't deny that. You may not like my opinion of him doing that. Mm-hmm. You may think that it's something else, but you can't deny that truth. Yeah. yeah. And and even when you I noticed like even with the facts of that, even when we look at 
um, the um, secession documents when we have we look at speeches by Lincoln like mm-hmm. all the things there's fact upon pa- facts upon facts we have receipt receipts because history keeps receipts right and people will gaslight you right <laughs> It's really psychological warfare mm-hmm. that we're that, that's happening now, where it's like you keep repeating a lie until people believe that lie, and you see that strategy with any kind of like, you know, um, um, you see that when it comes to cults. Yes, um, you see mm-hmm. that when it comes to um, like um, communism, di- dictatorships, like when right. there's some type of oppressive regime you see that Mm -hmm. um and so like history books you know you have to read i mean like we've been here before and so it's just amazing you know you know i follow you and i i I see some of the things and it's like facts upon facts and i mean you always and one thing that you do is you always use scholarly documents you're not just googling you know right (laughs) Right. exactly you know and and so and you're not just quoting someone else but you're using scholarly resources um you know to to back up the things that you're saying but one of the things that you know i tell our community and our team is like you gotta hold stuff like with open hands and like you you know you give people the truth and it's at the end of the day you know it may go in one ear and out the other. Exactly. But, you know, and we don't transform hearts. Like I mm-hmm. can't change your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can give you this truth or I can give you this information and what you do with it, that's your responsibility. And so at the end of the day, your story will not be that you didn't know. Your story will be that someone told you and you refused to listen. Yeah. And that's Dif- that's a different type of responsibility. And that's something different that you have to sit with because there's going to be a lot of people there's going to be a lot of people that at the end of the day, someone tried to tell you, tell you, but you refused to listen, you know. And so uh, and so and we have to sometimes leave people in that for our sanity and for our health and for um, just the the common good, you know. But you mentioned your book, yeah. which is coming Yay. May the 30th, Yay. 2023. And is everybody come alive? A memoir of s in essays and so um this is like i think when this airs it will be co- a little closer to that time i know mm-hmm. we're trying to do it like a little bit before your book comes out and i i mean first of all you're such a brilliant writer like you are oh, what i call so a much. word smith you are a word smith like it's just a gift and and then this thing it's like you meet all these people that have all these things bottled up and it's and sometimes it just takes this moment in time or just the connection with other people and it just comes alive because i think this happening um to your kid was like a catalytic moment for you it was like a, a turning point where okay i'm trying to fit in this space and this this is like I, I i have to use my voice you know and and i and i'm so grateful you know just the thing there like you said a lot of great things in, in the sense of you weren't alone in that you know because there are people of peace around you know right. there are some people in in most places like i i, I believe that that there mm-hmm. are some people that are like-minded are that people that lead with empathy rather than apathy people Mm -hmm. who are willing to listen that can that can help in those times you know Mm -hmm. and but i know there's 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 places in our country where people feel alone and they have communities like yours and like be the bridge where they can feel seen and the internets <laughs> mm-hmm. make us a lot closer, you know? Right. So, you know, if you're in a, if you're listening to this and you're in a community like that where you feel alone, um, where you feel unseen, or if you if you feel like your family is being marginalized in, in certain environments, like there are choices for you, mm-hmm. you know? And there are communities where you can feel seen. You just have to search those out, you know. And um, and so, you know, because I, that is a lonely place. And then sometimes what happens in those environments is you just decide, well, I'm just going to try to fit in. I'm going to stuff everything 
And that does damage. Mm -hmm. It does damage. So tell us a little bit about Black Coffee with White Friends. How did that even come about? Like, I, I remember, like, during that time, you were in the very early stages when we started Be The Bridge Groups. Yeah, I was. Um, you know? I, I, I think before that, I've oh. always written. I've always... I used to write Max letters all the time. Okay. Um, uh -huh. I wrote a lot of letters to Max about my faith because I wanted okay. them, because I wanted them to know, this is the thing, when you have a teen, yeah. once they hit 13, <laughs> they ain't trying to like hear you. They just, right. they're not. I mean, they are, but they're not. It's mostly okay. that, that's where it changes. You become uh -huh. the listening agent. They're talking to you, but it's all very one-sided. They're just telling mm -hmm. you, they'll give you the drop. It's usually when you're ready to go to bed and it's like nine o'clock at night and then they want to tell you about their whole day and how it fits into the whole of the universe, 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. And, you know, I started writing, when, when Trump was running for office, I wanted Max, I didn't have that from my mom. I wanted yeah. Max to know exactly where I was in my life and my faith, how I was processing what I was seeing in the world. Actually, it was before that. It was when Trayvon was okay. um, um, lynched. I, when yeah. that happened, I wanted Max to know that I mm. saw and I see Right. Mm. And I wasn't sure if my mom saw what I went through as a kid because, mm. you know, there wasn't a lot on the record. So I um, started writing these letters to Max and, and I would I, I was a big I was a runner um, back in the day before, you know, age. And, and the doctor was like, you need you got to stop. So like okay. I would run and then I would take these long walks and I would drag my husband on them and I'd be telling him all that I was seeing. And he was like, please write a blog or, I, I mean, I'm good to listen, but I'm, I, it was overwhelming for him. He's just like, I don't know what you expect me, British uh -huh. polite guy to do with all this that you're saying, and maybe you should do something with it. And so I go, well, yeah, maybe I could do a blog. And then the next day I'd be like, I ain't doing a blog. And then the next day I go, to a blog and I'd be like I'm not going to do a blog and then everything happened with Trump when he announced okay. I said I'm doing a blog because this was okay. around the time of the slave debate debacle and I'm having these meetings at the school and I decided that I was going to put these letters in this blog about my relationship with whiteness and white friends and mm -hmm. for, so my kid could navigate what my thinking was right mm -hmm. And I said to Simon, I didn't know we were home. And I just said, I don't know what they even call this. What do you call this? And yeah. I said, what, what is my life? I said, my life is a bunch of me, you know, being the black coffee, sitting around with white friends. Like, that's really what my life is. It's black coffee with white friends. Wow. You know? And he said, that's it. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. I'm not trying to. Because I was still... Oh, you know, maybe maybe my head was above the sunken place and the rest of my body was still in the sunken place. You know, like my thinking was clear, but my actions weren't there yet. And it felt too far to call it that. And now I look at it I'm like, it's so benign. But um, I thought it was super radical. And so I did it. I named it that. And he my husband's a. Uh, um, a uh, topographer, and um, uh, uh, he did the cover of my book. Um, yeah. And so he's like, if I make you a really, really cool logo, will you, will you promise me you will name it this? Because wow, I think, he, he, you know, his thinking was, I think you'll feel more confident and you'll be more honest if you call mm. it what it is rather than try to... I was like thinking, I think one of the, one of the titles was luminous things with marcy walker like it was all like this kind of like where i could kind of still be hidden and he's just like no you need to call it what it is and so wow. i did and that was 
the end of the story. Like that, that was the beginning of the end, the end of the beginning. I don't know, but you yeah. know, and it's, it served me well because what it did is it really showed me who, who was open because yeah. I got a lot of flack from a lot of moms at that school. I know. I and know. even my mother-in-law on just the title, not anything that I had written or, you know, and it wasn't like I was writing anything terrible, but uh-huh. they were just really offended. Uh-huh. And they weren't offended by the black coffee part. If I had just named it black coffee, they would have thought that was beautiful. Think uh-huh. about that. It was because mm. I called them white friends. They mm. didn't want to be a white friend. They wanted to just be a friend. Mm-hmm. 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 Wow. But understanding how you define that, you know, and the story behind why you're you're naming you're mm-hmm. naming that position mm-hmm. because of what you, your experience, you right. know, exactly. and how it looks different. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think sometimes before we get so offended, we should listen, um, be able to mm-hmm. listen to um, our why and understand mm-hmm. it. And then and then they would say, well, I couldn't say, you know, white coffee with black friends. <laughs> like, right. you know, exactly. And no, and no, you couldn't because of history. No, you, you can't. Yeah. You can't yeah. because mm-hmm. of history. But you write, um, you write, we spend our lives proving that we are worthy to be in the rooms that we enter. But only one qualifier should be required for us to enter and exit rooms. Human. But this is not the world in which we live. Our world tattoos on us names labels and classifications that can change the direction where we choose to journey and the atmosphere of the rooms we choose to enter when we get there. Yeah. Like Selah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's yeah. We do. And it's like you can and what happens is what you describe you know, in, in in a lot of your story and in a lot of our stories is that, you know, you try to fit in and and try to um, um, prove your worthiness of why you're there. But sometimes when you let that go, you know, I know when I moved to Austin, I said that I was going to be fully Tasha. No Thank matter God. what space I was <laughs> going into, mm-hmm. I was going to be fully Tasha because mm-hmm. I had left an environment um, like some years before where I was in a predominantly African-American church where I sat silent on a lot of things where I should have used my voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I didn't ask the questions, you know, that I should have asked. I made an idol out of that church and that pastor. Mm-hmm. And so because when you go through something like that, you learn, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and then you get a little older too. So yeah, I, I'm exactly. a little older, you know, I'm a lot older now. But at that time, I was like, if I am in this, whatever space that I'm in, mm-hmm. I am going to speak truth because it is truth that makes us free. And I feel like if I wouldn't have had that like posture, mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't be sitting here today, you know, yes. and and and, um, and you know, and so I think that's just really important um, for us. And I see even with you, like, you know, um, like you said, you were like you already had this gifting, but it was stirred up by the things that were happening because you mentioned Trayvon Martin um, and, you know, and his murder and lynch, his lynching. Um, and that was the same. That was the catalytic event for me yes. when you know, being in predominantly white spaces, I was like, okay, y'all not talking about this? Or, oh, you just, oh, you see him as a thug? Like, why do you even class him? Why are you even seeing him as a thug? Mm -hmm. Like, why don't you see him as a child? And why, how can't you see that this is wrong? Like, if any adult was following me, (laughs) I would Mm -hmm. feel like I have to defend myself. And just just all the things that you, you, you were hearing at that time. And I remember that conversation switched from having it with black people to mm-hmm. now like, OK, if we're going to do this thing and we're saying we're community and this is like supposed to be the kingdom of God, exactly. then you need to care about the things that I care about. And I care about this situation mm-hmm. and why you why you don't want to talk about it. And then why is your perspective that? So that was shocking to me. 
Um, because I think there was a reason why I never had those type of conversations because I feared in how they would turn out. So there was a reason why I kept that separate. Yeah. But not understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an interesting thing. I, um, I recently did a post about the um, Asbury revival. And mm. just to be clear, I had no problems with a move of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, I believe in that truly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What I questioned was why was the people from the far right and why were a lot of white people looking at it as the solution to everything that was divisive in the church that this was the saving grace. I was like, I find it interesting that a school that was founded by pro-slavery Methodists that was also um, an all whites only school until the late 60s, it didn't accept its first black student, that you would think that this is where God would speak because of the 2% of black folks on the campus, one or three showed up and that is enough integration for you. And um, and why do you feel that this is, I, I was just like, because there are revivals that happen on HBCs all the time. Like they, they do revival too, but no one's pointing a camera at them and saying, look at what God's doing. God's speaking to the whole of the world through this one nucleus experience. And mm. I got so much pushback from, and it really was earnest people who, and, and white, black, age, I had it from all ways, but mostly white. I had it from, mm. and the thing was, they didn't want me to squash their hope. And I said, but mm. your hope can't come from the problem. Like, mm. if you're hoping that Monticello and, 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 um, Mount Vernon, is that where um, George Washington's um, work camp mm -hmm. presentation is? If you're yeah. thinking that this is the place where where the Holy is going to arrive, that disturbs me. Like, why? Would, it's like you're saying that people gathered at a monument of um, of a Confederate monument, which is basically what that campus represents through its history, that this is where God's showing up. The fact that you're okay to just look away from that. And I also was saying, but there were revivals during the times of segregation. There were revivals during the times of um, antebellum. There were, there've always been revivals and we haven't, they haven't united us, particularly when they've been completely homogenous. And for some people, just one or two makes it not homogenous. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's that's just a sprinkle. Like I'm I'm just like, that's yeah. not, it's not, it's not balanced. So I had someone in the comments say, well, if you're so concerned about integration, you go there and you integrate it. And it was not realizing how very racist that comment mm -hmm. is, I'm sure she didn't realize it as that, mm -hmm. because I said, what you're not understanding is that if I just arrive and there are two white people, I've integrated the space. All I have to do is step into a room and mm -hmm. a space is, and I've integrated it. Like, and that's mm -hmm. basically what happened to me as a mom on this campus. All I had mm -hmm. to do was arrive and they could say, oh, we're integrated because mm -hmm. there is the one, right? And so mm -hmm. I, I think when we come into rooms, you know, any, any woman can say this. It's like, mm -hmm. um, if, if you are the one woman on the board, if you're the one woman who's part of the management team, if you're the one woman who works in a field that usually is all male, mm -hmm. a lot of rooms will check that, will check the work off as being done. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's really important for us to see that it's not about um, what the room looks like. It's about what our humanity looks like in that room. So mm -hmm. it's much more important to assess what is the what is the level of humanity in this room? Because if I'm in the room, but I can't be fully human, 
then it's not it's it's integrated only in a photo. And that's mm-hmm. as far as the integration goes. It, it's only integrated in being able to check a box, but it's not integrated in spirit. Right. So that's really what that's about. Like, because I have to be able to come into the ro- a room and be like you said, I'm gonna come full Tasha. Uh-huh. I need to be able to come into a room and be fully human in order for it to be a space that is truly you unified. And mm-hmm. and I hope for that for every single other person in the room as well. As well, 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 as well. I'm so glad that you're saying that. And and what and whether some people agree with what you're saying or not you you have the right to say that you know Mm -hmm. and and to really challenge the thought process because it does and sometimes we this is the thing sometimes we're sensing the same thing but some most people can't articulate the way you just articulated that and then when you hear you're like god that's exactly what i was feeling but it's 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 like this thing where i hear a lot of people when it comes to this work of justice and righteousness where I see it as discipleship. I, right. this is a part of the gospel. Um, and, and I, I don't separate that. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I, I don't, I don't separate that. But then when I hear people say, we're just going to teach the gospel. Yes. And I'm like, First of all, so you're saying this is not the gospel. That's what, that's what, how I interpret it. Right. But then you're saying like, okay, we haven't been, teaching the gospel for how many years like yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? and, and and what did that what has that done like mm-hmm. when you just frame it like that um where you know when you just frame it like that it just it's like w- what are you missing and so i think some of that is is where people feel like see if we just focus on this everything is going to be okay but we've we've always done that right Right. we've always done that and Mm -hmm. just with anything else you're going to name sin you Mm -hmm. know you have to name sin and Mm -hmm. and so in naming that you know um what's wrong with naming that you know so it's Mm -hmm. just those things i think just getting it just makes people uncomfortable and what we're, we're seeing is just the the discomfort that people are, are are feeling and then also the disengagement like there's a lot of disengagement now um that you're seeing especially over since the um I, what we call the summer of i like the way you put it um half reckoning somewhat reckoning yeah. i'm gonna reckon but then i'm gonna go back and right, right, exactly <laughs> I, don't what, I don't know what, I don't what, know what, what we yeah. but to me that was a part of a revival Exactly. I that, exactly. I believe that what was happening in 2020, when mm-hmm. you look across what impacted not just America, but the, the world. world. Yes. Because God is at work in other places besides the United States. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And that impacted like there were churches coming together, people coming together, people of all different ethnicities, you know, um, of all different denominations. uh, I mean, all of them coming together, you know, with this stance for justice and righteousness and to and to really say we're going to lift up the the marginalized that that shook people. It really shook. It should put yeah. people in power. And now, you know, there's, you know, within six months, you saw this, 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 this stepping back from that, you know, mm-hmm. um, because of, um, you know, um, CRT and all the other things that people kind of gaslighted to, to what right. it is. And, right. um, you know, woke is all these things that you see in this pushback. And I was like, that was like truly. And even when you see, people who were non-Christians that was happening for the first time, they were having hope Mm -hmm. and they were having hope within the Christian faith. Like um, Ta-Nehisi Coates was one of those people that I saw an interview with him. Right. He's, He's not a believer. No. And see that it was penetrating his heart to see this oneness Mm -hmm. that was happening. Um, you know, he said, for the first time in my life, I feel hope. Yes. And that's something that he he was very careful to say that he didn't have in his book. And yeah. the, the thing that I find 
that I think really, really scared scared um, the establishment, so to speak, is mm-hmm. it was across um, economic um, yes uh, economic communities like poor communities, middle class communities, and yeah. then on top of it, it was interfaith. So you have mm-hmm. yeah. Christians. Jews, Mormons, yeah. Um, yeah. you have all these people, you have Muslims coming out together. You have people using their platform to, and I think that's when it gets scary for them. Yeah. It's because it is a system, an established system that in its foundation, um, it has, there has to be this separation of communities. Um, Poor black communities cannot be cool with poor white communities because that is the big um, challenge that, that, that could overthrow the whole thing and make the whole thing topple down. So if you have this racial construct that keeps people separate, or if you have a faith construct that keeps people separate. And even in um, the Christian faith, there's a faith construct that keeps us separate even within our own community. Um, Mm -hmm. You can play these uh, dog whistles and you can play up to the ones that you know will vote for you, the ones who you know will support your cause. And you can keep that division and you can do it in the name of Jesus without people being able to see what it is that you're doing. Because what they'll say mm-hmm. is that I just I just feel that we shouldn't talk about race because we're all made equal. And it's like it's one thing to be made equal. It's another thing to yeah. be treated equal. Mm. It's one thing to be made equal and then treated equal. It's another thing to have equity. It's Mm. one thing to be made equal, treated equal, have equity, but it's a whole nother thing to have um, retribution and reparations and reconciliation, all Mm. which are biblical. There's no way around it. They are biblical. And, Mm. you know, it's interesting to me that, like, for one thing, Mm -hmm. I love one of the things I think is missing in Moses' story because okay. I've been thinking a lot it. about Moses these days, uh-huh. is, okay, so Moses leaves. But uh-huh. we forget that they didn't leave empty-handed. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. They didn't leave without their stuff. They didn't mm-hmm. leave without family unit. Mm-hmm. I don't think people understand that when we were emancipated. When our ancestors were emancipated, they left without mom, without dad, sometimes without wife, without child. And there Mm -hmm. are, you can go look in the National Archives, there are um, ads that they would pay to take out saying that they were looking for their family. So Mm -hmm. they were in the wilderness, they were in a wilderness of one. And Mm -hmm. they didn't leave with a, with job opportunities. They didn't leave with with um, land. They didn't leave with a lot. At least, at the very least, <laughs> Moses' people had the land of the wilderness. You know? Mm-hmm. It wasn't mm-hmm. where ultimately they were to settle, but they had the promise of land, the promise mm-hmm. of something that they would call their own. And mm-hmm. that is something that we had for a half a second. And then... <laughs> It was taken right. back. So mm-hmm. I think yeah. we, we, we love to look to the biblical text to see all the ways that God has blessed, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we don't like to look at the biblical text to see all the ways that God has interrogated and corrected. And I and I wish that we were bold enough and trusted that our God truly is a God of mercy, a God of love, a God of justice. And justice mm. is scary because yes. I always say, I actually my new prayer is, Lord, I, I want justice, even if that means me. 
You mm. know what I mean? Because yeah. that's how justice works. Justice doesn't yeah. work. It's not, it's like, okay, if you are truly just, that means that you will be, that I too, my injustices that I've imposed will also have to be looked at and um, mm-hmm. I will have to pay for them. You know what I mean? And uh-huh. nobody wants that. I, I sure right. know. But that's <laughs> what I'm just like, mercy's new every day. Thank goodness. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, yeah. Right, right, and right. I have thought, and I, I, there was a chapter in the book that I didn't put into the book because it, it got uh-huh. a little, but one of the things is I'm like, well, in this country, God has been extremely merciful. I mm. mean, there is no reason for anyone who comes from an ancestral line of enslavement to still have wealth. Yeah. And that's yes. not a blessing. I think it's or a mercy. Peace of mind. Yeah. Or peace of mind. Or peace of mind. I you think know, it's no, a mercy. I think yes. that is God's mercy. Yes. I do not yes. think that's, I think that is God saying, you know, what it should be is this. Mm-hmm. But because I'm merciful and because mm-hmm. vengeance in the end is going to be God's and God's alone, yeah. um, that's, that's where this lands. And I think if we all could come at this with, you know, on our knees, you know, oh, oh God, you know, have mercy on me for I am a sinner, we would see our humanity in one another so mm. much more beautifully and without mm. threat because, yeah. and, and that the, the gift of mercy is abundance. It gives mm. so much more abundance in the world. When you can be merciful, it's like, to me, the, the key to, I, and I think it's why Jesus is so talks so much about abundance is that Jesus is so merciful. Mm. Yes. And yes. we don't often like to talk about mercy. We like to talk about grace, but we don't want to talk about mercy yeah. and we don't want to talk mm. about, you know, God interrogating us. But I think mm. that God does interrogate and God is super merciful in, in yeah. that interrogation. Man, there's so much. Oh, my goodness. There's so much when you talk about um, just um, familial um, 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 racism, you know, the manifestation yeah. of generational trauma that you talk about in your book. Um, you know, you know, you even talk about um, learning from the example set by parental figures. And you, we ju- I think you just hit on the ways interpretations of the Bible reinforce racialized stereotypes, mm-hmm. you know, and um, and the embracing the fullness of your body and soul. Um, there is a lot within these pages. I can't wait to 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 read it. One thing I did want you before we um, close, and we may just do like a bonus section. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I think I want to come back to one of those. But there's one thing I wanted to to mention. You start the book with the story before we begin. Oh, yeah. Um, it is it's really powerful. You begin with first things first. I was born in reflection of the divine, simply human. Even just the first line is beautiful and so powerful. Um, and then you tell a story of being in the midst of a church service when you were young and a, and, a, and a white man enters and changes everything. You say our spirits were besieged because a white man entered our sacred routine and we didn't know if he was a saint or a demon. That day, more than 30 years ago, our country's pedigree of a white supremacy, slavery, segregation and genocide has swag, um, swaggered into our house of worship, and we had no idea how to handle it because we had no power to name it. Um, just, I want you to just talk a little bit um, um, about about that. Yeah. So I, I went to. I grew up in this very small church called Rome Baptist Church. Hi, fam. <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> hey, um, and um, it was a very small church in um, Oakwood, Ohio, and you know, it was a black Southern Baptist church, and 
we were in the middle of our, um, we just finished like the call to worship. We just finished that. I think maybe we were moving. We just done announcements or something like that. And um, a white man walked into our church and it was, you have to understand, I'm 53. So the generation of adults, they all would have come, they all would have been either part of the great migration, a remnant of it, they would have been remnants of, they would have been the sons and daughters of Jim Crow. My grandparents yeah. certainly were. Um, mm-hmm. They would have been Your my parents. Grand- yeah, my grandfather was the son of, a, you know, they would have been the sons and daughters of enslaved people, like, because it's only like three generations to four generations back. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when this white man walked in, they all, everything changed. Because mm-hmm. you know how you are when you're at home and, you know, you kick your shoes off, you take your bra off, you you know, you, you take the wig <laughs> off, you, you, you home, right? Right. So, you know, we even had a lady in our church that sometimes took her wig off, scratched her head, threw that wig back on because she's home. You know, she's family, right? Yeah. So we are in our family thing, you know, like I'm sure some sisters that kicked off their shoes underneath the, you know, pew, you know, pushed them underneath the pew. We're, we're home. And all of a sudden this white man entered and we really didn't know what why he was there. Like, Mm -hmm. we didn't know what he was going to do. And Mm -hmm. you could just feel the tension. You could Mm -hmm. feel everyone on the ready. Like, oh, something's about to pop off. And really, the only reason he was there was because he had heard the music through the window of the call and worship. Because, you know, this is back in the day and it was a little tiny church. And, you know, yeah. we, we I don't know if they ever got that air conditioning. We had a benevolent <laughs> fun forever. I don't know if we ever got that air conditioning. <laughs> I, hope, I, hope, I hope the church got the air conditioning by that. They got the air conditioning. <laughs> I went to college, we still didn't have the air conditioning. So oh it was goodness. a really small church of yeah. poor people, not, not uh-huh. wealthy people. So... He came in and they took him off to a side room and they prayed with him. But honestly, I hadn't thought of that story until Dylan Ruth Mm. went into that prayer meeting and massacred members of this church during their prayer meeting. I didn't even think about that until I saw that story on the news and I thought, that day back all those years ago could have gone a whole different way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The interesting thing about it for me is that I have noticed that when I come into a church that is predominantly white, there is a tension that I can sense, like people trying to figure out what I'm about, why am I there? And then there's this overwhelming attention towards me. Everybody wants to save the one black person who walked through the door. I don't know how many times I've been to an all white church and I've had to say over and over again, no, I've been I've been following Jesus since I was 12. Like, I've been like, you know, because, you know, they want that that feather in the cap that, you know, so it's. I It's interesting to me how when a white man came in we were concerned for our safety we couldn't even at first be concerned for his needs because we were concerned for our safety because that had been the history there have been many times that churches have been attacked by Mm -hmm. um by white people who wanted to take the church out as a symbol of the community as a symbol of of um, unity for black people. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, you have the church bombings, you have church fires, it goes on and on and on. And so I started the book out there because Mm -hmm. I wanted people to kind of enter into the book, understanding that if you're a white person entering into this book, you might have moments where you feel a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. that's nothing compared to the number of times that even in our own space, 
yeah. whiteness enters and can just one white man suddenly everything changes. Mm. That doesn't mm-hmm. happen the other way. When I come to an all white church, they don't change the songs. They don't change. The culture doesn't change. None of that happens. But so often when a white person comes into black community, there are demands made, even if they don't say a word. You know what I mean? They draw all the air towards them. And there's and, and and the reason for that is that we are trying to secure our safety. It's not that we are. You know, we're, we're just trying to please them. We're just trying to make sure we're safe, trying to. And so the whole church service stopped. I have never gone to a white church and the service just stopped. You know, like this white man showed up and service stopped because mm-hmm. we couldn't even move forward with our worship until we figured out what was happening. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so I think it's just. A story that I'm to this day at 53 years old still processing how mm. this still happens and mm. a lot of I, I mean especially after Dylan Roof I would imagine that a small church anywhere in the south anywhere in this country if a white person just shows up unannounced there's going to be a moment of are we cool is everything good are we all good here because we have this traumatic history that we're supposed to not pay attention to. We're supposed to be colorblind to, but Mm -hmm. we can't afford to be colorblind because when we are colorblind, we could get shot, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think, ooh, there's so much there. I, I... I have noticed that, you know, in a lot of the historically um, black churches that there's security now because mm-hmm. of that, that changed mm-hmm. uh, a lot because, you know, I think there's there's so much there when, you know, when you say like, I think there's always been this thing, like when we look at um, that, that the black community um, wants vengeance. We don't want vengeance. We want oh, to good. be left no. alone. Yeah. Like, I mean, and you can see that like just throughout history it's just that we want the same thing things that that you want you know mm-hmm. uh, we want um, security for our families you know we want to have land we want to have you know um you know economic well, just and, and, and then many times to be left alone you know and exactly. that's it mm-hmm. and so I think um there's j- there's just so much there and I think that it's like sometimes like in books it's like we got to get people to pause and to and to think you know and to take account um and of, of what that means and how we in, interpret that and the, um and just the fact that you remember that story cuz like you and I um uh, we're just a, a few years apart mm-hmm. and um, I haven't crossed over yet, but I'm about to cross over. <laughs> you know? It's fine. The water's fine. It's warm. Yeah. Mm. It's warm. Is it's it warm? warm. <laughs> it's always at the perfect temperature. Let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> so so I, I'm just like, um, you know, but we are the first ones, you know, if you're born in the 70s or the late 60s, it just depends on when you're the first one in your family, like, of, of, you know, that was born with a, a full set of rights. For me, my mom and my dad were born into segregation, you know, mm-hmm. and so and they have those stories. And so we're really so I mean, and I'm living and breathing and, you know, uh, I mean, Ruby Bridges is only in her late 60s. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, she has an Instagram. Like, it blows my yeah, mind. Yeah, she has an Instagram. Yeah. And, and she just showed off her, so I think Converse made her some chucks yes. with her um, with her picture on it when she was a little girl. And so I'm just saying like, this is not, this is very recent. And so it's very fresh in our history. And mm. um, and so, and, and it's very important, but so, you know, so when you, you, you walk into a room like that, when to get people to think, because th- how they, their associations are with their experiences, you know, exactly. um, you know, my great grandfather, like, you know, his association with, was with his, um, uh, you know, his experiences. So when growing up in the South and poor rural Robinson County, you know, he would go get 
gas and you know a, a, a white man comes up he would say yes sir no sir you know all exactly. these things mm -hmm. and, and just the kindness uh, that he would have to exude because what he has, had lived through you mm -hmm. know and um there's this mask that that we wear and and, and he, he, there's one brother that my grandmother and them had he wanted to get so far away from the south because it just he hated hearing his dad like like grovel you know to to white people and what my grandfather uh, my great grandfather says to his son is like boy i gotta live down here with these people yes i heard and that a lot too i gotta yeah. survive you mm -hmm. know and so you know in our in our families we've been in such a um you know a a, a just this sense of survival for so long, you know. So I think it's it's just important for us to have these conversations. And I think it's an honor for those of you who are listening, uh, my white brothers and sisters, it's an honor um, when we invite you into these sacred conversations, you yeah. know, when we invite you into our pain and our, and our stories. And a lot of times that's for you to listen and um, to ask yourself, what is God trying to say to me in this? Um, what is God speaking? What am I missing? And for you to process, and sometimes you need to process before you say something, before you hit the comment section, before you retaliate or before you engage and to kind of sit with it. Mm -hmm. And say, what am I missing? And then it's nothing wrong. I had a a, a young lady who came into my comments um, in, in, in the DMs and was the way she asked the question, she was really trying to understand. And I can sense the humility. We can sense right. the humility. Right. You can. And I will engage that mm -hmm. if, 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 if it's being led through um, humility. But then there's sometimes where people are just like, no, you wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so it's just different with, with that. But I want to hear what are some things um, right now that are um, I ask everyone this because, you know, we're all lamenting about, you know, different things. There's a lot happening. Um, mm -hmm. What are some things that you're lamenting right now? Marcy? You know, it's funny. You, I was actually thinking about this um, when you were talking about your 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 grandfather and your your uh -huh. your family, your parents. Um, and so we have this this generational trauma. And how I wish I was thinking how many might be thinking, yeah, but now we don't have that, but we do. The generational. The thing that makes me so sad that I'm lamenting is that my kid has the trauma not only of generations past for African-American history, but also school shootings. And mm -hmm. then they have Trayvon Martin, Rihanna Taylor, Tyree Nichols, mm -hmm. Mike Brown, Sandra Bland, mm -hmm. all this mm -hmm. happened. So they didn't escape that racial trauma, but also they have it that there's different trauma and that trauma of school mm -hmm. shootings that I didn't have. And so right. I've been really grieving that because, you know, I, I hope to have grandbabies someday. I've been uh -huh. told I can hang on a lot longer, that that's not going to be happening for a long, <laughs> long time, which is fine. They're in college. They're, they're doing their thing. But uh -huh. <laughs> I hope when it does happen, I, I, I'm already lamenting what, what will the world be? Like, mm. um, what will the backlash be of all the advances that that mm -hmm. my kid will have, my grandkid will have to pay for? Because mm. what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement, and, and I mean that not as the movement itself, but I mean that as in all the names, say her name, and right. all, the, all the, you know, the, our phones capturing, actually yeah. filming lynchings. Um that's a backlash of all the progress that was made mm -hmm. after Dr. King's death. So after Dr. King's death, the housing um, act got passed, fair housing got passed. Yeah. And after that, the um, busing was, you know, restructured. And then you and I were able to enter into schools that we may not have uh -huh. been able to enter before. 
And there's a backlash to all that. We have all the, you know, the stop and frisk and all the things that came out of that. And we don't see for generations, for a good generation, what the effect of that is. And the effect Mm. is Trayvon, Sandra Bland, because Mm. when Jim Crow laws were dropped, policing upticked. And so our generation, my generation, policing became, you know, that's why you have, you know, all the NWA and all the rap stuff that comes out. And so because we're responding to that backlash from all the games. So I'm just yeah. like, with every game, I'm like, I'll, I'll be celebrating. I'll be like, ooh, yay, we got Juneteenth. Thank you for that little bit of retribution. How are we going to have to pay for this? You know, yeah. like, I'm like, what's going to be the yeah. cost, you know? So I actually want yeah. something else. I would yeah. rather you have passed the, the George Floyd police in that first. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's like, you know, yeah. and if that passes, then what will that look like? And if there's another... Yeah female president, then what will be the backlash of it? So I think I grieve the constant backlash, I guess. And I grieve this young generation, these Gen Zers who are, you know, I know that people call it woke, but I don't think they're woke. I think they're just, they're just very present. They're in the present moment. And unfortunately for them, or fortunately, their present moment is actually the time that they're deciding who they are as human beings. So all the things matter. When I was when I was their age, you know, <laughs> everything mattered. Michael Jackson mattered, you know, like yeah. in a way that no person that don't know you and ain't paying your bills should matter. But matter. Right. Madonna mattered. These are the <laughs> things that mattered, right? Yeah. We didn't have school shootings. You know, yeah. like it, they weren't they existed, but they weren't we didn't have cell phones capturing them. And so yeah. we didn't have the same you know, I remember the big uproar was me fighting with my parents about MTV and BET yeah. because my yeah. Christian grandparents did not want that in their house. And mm. and I remember like my being so happy that I had older sisters and brothers who could mm-hmm. buy it for themselves on their own TV who right. lived at home. But, you know, it's just. It was a different thing. So it was for it forms who we are. And so when Public Enemy came out, that formed. So this is what's happening with this Gen Z generation. They're not you can be afraid of the the word woke, which is silly to me, but it's not that they're woke. It's just that they're they're in their lives. They're in their lives that are far more diverse than than ours were, far more integrated. even though not fully integrated, but, mm-hmm. you know, they're not the generation that will go their whole lives never meeting another person of color. That's yeah. not going to be their story. Yeah. So they have a different way of processing the world. Mm. And yeah. I I don't want them to have to pay too high a price for it. Yeah, yeah. Because we haven't seen the impact of the trauma. We see what the trauma brought to um, our parents' generations right. in the seventies, in the sixties, um, and we saw the what the backlash was. I mean, we can name, we can sit here and name all the backlashes that happened through right. policy, through um, you know um, geographical racism, like right. all all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that that is something when we think about the, what what this is going to cause to our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, 20 years, 30 years. I mean, we're already seeing some of the impact of it, right. but, we're, we're, but we're too busy looking downstream and rather looking upstream and say, hey, how do we how do we stop this? You know, mm-hmm. and then what resources are we going to need to be putting in place? Because I, I don't know. I've never had to live through a school shooting. Exactly. But I could not. I mean, like even now, like even some of the things that we experienced. I mean, I remember just this 4th of July was different from me. Yes. Hearing fireworks go off was like 
traumatic for me. Like I don't want to go to a fireworks show, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and I haven't lived through that, but the association with that now, I know how it's impacted me. So I can only imagine even just hearing the students recently at the, um, the college campus and this, this young lady said like she jumped out this window and was running for her life and you know and she's had she had that same experience where she had to do that at a high school so she's done lived through two of these like the impact of that you right. know the impact of that mm-hmm. and the impact that's going to happen when she has children if she exactly. has children so, exactly um, so I, I'm with you in that what is something that's bringing you joy right now what is something that's bringing you joy Oh man. Um, okay, I it, I'm a I I just need people to know that I don't sit and pontificate, you know, the woes <laughs> of racism and such like 24/7 and that's just right. all that I do. I I just that's not what I do. <laughs> I usually like I will hop. It's funny because both Max and Simon have said we are going to film you. We're going to record you when you get done with a live or an interview, what you do afterwards. And usually I have like a small little twerk party, even though I'm not very good at twerking or, you know, like I, I just I think to me, the joy of just. (laughs) <laughs> I am like goofy in that way. But right. what really is bringing me joy, I know you like Hallmark movies. Yes. I know you like Hallmark movies. I am a reality TV person. Oh. Okay. And okay. I just finished all of Atlanta. Like, oh, and I, you like the drama. You like the I, drama. <laughs> and I crack up because, you know, I have been, I think there was, um, I think it was Cherie Whitfield. And she okay. she did this aside where she said something to, that was so funny. I was on my exercise bike. I almost fell off laughing. Like I just the 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 shade the the amount of it. And um, I'm here for the Bachelor. I like I watch it right. all. And like, but I've been also commentating on it in my in my black eyed stories in my newsletter okay. because I do see things in the culture. I'm like, it's funny how. It's uh-huh. funny how, how race plays out in these things, but really it's just sheer entertainment. I'm looking at the clothes. Right. I'm looking at the, I'm just, I'm right. looking at, you know, what the shoes yeah. they're wearing, the hair. I'm here in yeah. the house. I'm like, I'm here for it. I'm yeah. trying to get to Atlanta so I could go to the old girl gang restaurant. Like the, the girl gang? Yeah, the old old lady gang <laughs> restaurant, candy versus. My cousins just came, and that's the first thing they wanted to do, to go to Candy's restaurants. And I'm like, they were like, have you been? And I'm like, uh, no. Yeah, yeah, I am trying to get, I am trying to get there. Like, I am. Yeah, I have it. I am, I can't even believe it. You gotta come down. You You right there. You have a place to stay. You have a place to stay. (laughs) Then you come, and you can do your your reality show uh, tour um, here in Atlanta. You're gonna be very surprised that most of these places don't look like it does on TV. I'm sure they like, don't. Like I, I, I still, I need very to see it. Yeah, <laughs> I still want to see. I know that it's yes, underwhelming. Yes. Like I've already, yes. I've already. But decided. Atlanta's great. Yeah, they're, they're great, and there's so many people, entrepreneurs, and people here that are doing everything. Like what I say is like if you want to see brown people just. Just, just killing it. Come yeah. to Atlanta. I know it's happening everywhere in a lot of places, but just like you know, you got your your vegan, re- you know, restaurants, yeah. mm-hmm. vegan, like all these things yeah. you're gonna experience here, and it really lifts you. It really it lifts you. It challenges you. Yes. It Speak normalizes it. success. Mm-hmm. You yes. Know? It, it, you know, and all of that, and so. Um, yeah, we're, I, I'm here for it. You know, I, it's not to say that I don't want to go to um, um, these places, but like her, it's a very small restaurant. Like, it's, and you have like, choices. You have so many choices yeah. there. Like you so were just many. saying, I can, yeah, I can go almost a whole year and eat at 
um, just black owned restaurants. Like, you know, yeah. you can go a whole year. And that's not even including like, um, you know, the, the yeah. Latin um, yeah. uh, restaurants and, and, and the Asian, like, I, I mean, you can really just venture right. into buy our restaurants for several years mm-hmm. here. Like when you start talking about ownership and just the different cuisines and different things like that here in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So which is pretty, and I know that's special that a lot of places don't have that. I'm pretty sure Chicago has um, well, where some I'm of at that. Does. My, um, yeah. my neighborhood of Hyde Park is my other great joy. It brings me so much oh, joy. Yeah. I love it so much. I live not far from University of Chicago. Okay. But I live in the black, black is most diverse part of Hyde Park. And okay. um, like around the corner from me is a James Beard award winning restaurant. Okay. That's okay. black owned. It's my favorite uh-huh. place to take people because to have this upscale restaurant where the wow. whole, and you look in the whole cook line because it's an exposed kitchen where you can see an open air kitchen and everyone in there is in their chef's white and they're all black and the service is the servers are black and the sommelier is black and the 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 artwork on the walls is black and but everyone in the place is diverse very diverse you'll see every you'll hear different languages and then around the corner i got a little pull boy place and you know we have uh-huh. our vegan restaurant that's black owned okay. we have a hamburger place we have i so, need to come there you really do i love it so very I much it. i love it like yeah. i i in the summer i did this thing of reels where I just said, I love my neighborhood. Like I would just film things. Like once we were taking the dog out for a walk and the marching band was practicing. And I was just like, you know, like it was like Beyonce's homecoming, like on my street, Uh just like random. You know, like you just never know what What flavor you're gonna gonna get or what you're gonna see when the pool boat plays. Um, opened, he hired like a New Orleans band to like sing it in and, you know, people came oh, out. Wow. And so you have this, and I'm not leaving because um, I don't live <laughs> far from the Obama's house here. I'm like blocks away and they're uh-huh. opening their um, their library along the lake. Uh-huh. Like it, it will be yeah. in walking distance to me. And when I found that out, I was like, oh, I'm <laughs> staying here because this real estate going to be going up. And we tried, so we're renting this condo, and we uh-huh. tried to get the owners to sell it to us. We're like, you don't want this trouble. Come on, sell it. <laughs> like, and they were like, it. oh, no, we're not letting go of this. So they're in on it, too. They're like, we're like, dang it. Because <laughs> they know what they got. So yes, I'm, yes. I'm really, I can't love my, I love my neighborhood so much that uh-huh. I'm very careful about who I invite to meet me here. Oh, it's such wow. a treasure to me that it's like one of those things like, if you don't come to my neighborhood and you don't get it, you can't uh-huh. come to my neighborhood. Like if you <laughs> don't get it. that, yes, there's a man over there playing the saxophone on the corner. And yes, uh-huh. the sister is singing Lauren Hill on this corner. Uh You need to understand all. And yes, there's a group of old men, brothers just sat outside of the Starbucks and the patio playing chess all day. Black men playing chess all day. And like, respect it, respect yes. it. Like my, yes. you can't respect my neighborhood. I, you can't come. We had the the funniest thing happen. I'll tell you this story, and you can cut it out. But it just it cracked me up so hard. Um, so Max really wanted to get their hair dyed pink. Okay. And okay. so luckily we live like finding a hairdresser in Austin was a whole thing. But yeah, so here yeah. it's like you just wherever you spit, there's somebody who does hair nails. <laughs> what you need, right? They got you. So um, we found the salon not far from our place. Like I put it in Google Maps thinking we're going to have to get in the car, drive an hour away. I forgot that I'm in my neighborhood. Of course, it's all going to be right here. So Max got their hair dyed pink and it was Uh fly as I mean, it was so pretty. And so we're walking from the hairdresser and there is this table of aunties. They don't know us from Ad- from Adam. They see Max and they're like, "Baby, oh baby, come on over here. Who did your hair?" They're like all up in my child's hair. 
<laughs> like I just got to respect. I, you know, because you know these my the aunties. They're just right. like, ooh, ooh, look at the shade. And then one's going, girl, I could do that. And they're like, girl, you can't do that. You can't do your hair like that. What are you talking about? You would not look good like that. Oh, girl, I think I could rock this. And it was so funny because then we were just stood there, the three of us, because Simon's with us and Max is just like, because they hadn't dismissed us. Like, we're so, we're so, we're like, they hadn't right. told us we could. And then, one of them, yeah, and then one of us said, oh, you can go, baby. Y'all have a good day. And we left. And right. they're out there all the time. When I tell you that when I walk that way, I make sure there's not one ashy knuckle. I make sure my <laughs> hair is straight. Because <laughs> I ain't trying to be called out by no They will call you out. You know? Because yeah. oh, I've seen my. them do it. I've seen them offer lotion to people. I've seen these <laughs> women like ask people like you know at, tell young men why did you just spit on the ground that's oh, the ground is yeah. sacred that's the lord's ground you don't spit on the ground and so i auntie shave it's yes, called auntie shave <laughs> it has been so such a blessing just to oh, have this wow. kind of community that will yeah. take my child and yeah. My child's head was so big that day. We could barely fit it through the front door because the aunties had given the blessing and said, yes, your hair is correct. And oh. you couldn't tell that kid nothing. That kid came in and spent out probably a good three hours doing nothing but taking selfies. So, <laughs> you know... I need to see one. I need to see one. Need oh to see my it. goodness. You need to come I be part of it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I love that. But like I can hear the joy in your voice when you talk about that. It just oh my us gosh. having that experience. When you're able to connect culturally, it's just a, a, a beautiful thing. I um I when I was just in Illinois, um, there was I spoke at a school there. Mm-hmm. And they had they brought in a, one of the local colleges that has a gospel choir. So mm. I heard gospel choir, and then I saw the gospel choir, and it was like predominantly all white choir. And then I was like, oh, oh, maybe they just meant choir. So mm-hmm. I'm just thinking like, oh, they just meant choir, you know. I'm just and I just mm-hmm. kept walking, and um, and I saw the the choir director was a, a, a black man, and I was like, oh, that's so good that you know yeah. that there's a choir. Cool. And then I was like, so I had, I didn't have any expectation they were going to sing gospel music. Right. And so um, the choir gets out there and it was like the old school, like Dang. 90s gospel. Yes. Like, <laughs> yes, like some Mary Mary. <laughs> it was older than that. It was like the, um, I can't, look, look, I'm, I'm, I'm dating myself, but like, it's like the, old the old gospel and they they were and you know what and they were enjoying it they were smiling they were rocking on beat and you know so and all that and i was like and i don't know why it made me emotional marcy like i when i went to i had to come up after that and i was like why is this thing touching my heart and i think when it when you because you see sometimes your culture, like your your worship culture rejected so much. Right. And to see it embraced and right. see that just this diversity engaging in what your people have have created and enjoying it and the audience enjoying it. And this man, this choir director being able to be fully himself in that moment, it just brought so much joy you know, um, to my heart. So I, I feel you like I, I see you. I'm so glad that, um, that you are where you are and I'm so excited about, um, your, your book that is about to come uh, out. And this again, um, you know, let's remind people, um, of the name, everybody come alive. And this is a, a memoir of essays, and it comes out May the thirtieth. And this is Marcy Walker, <laughs> and she is um, the person that is behind Black Coffee with r- White Friends, and she also has a um, a blog that you can, um, I think, like a Patreon you have that where you give do your your Black Eyed. Um, Bible Bible stories, right? Yeah, it's um it's Substack 
And I changed okay, so it okay. to um, Black Eyed Stories because sometimes I want to talk about the Other racism stuff. I see on Bachelor. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't. I can't. I can't necessarily connect it to the Bible, but we need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't unsee. You cannot unsee. You cannot so, unsee. Yeah, you'll get some culture. You'll get some Bible. You who knows yeah, what I'll be okay. talking about. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, great. I, well, we're looking forward to it. It's been great to have this conversation. You can follow her on Instagram and on all the socials. And um, thank you for listening to um, the Be The Bridge um, um, podcast. I hope this um, conversation is enlightening for you. Um, if it was challenging for you, that's okay, too. <laughs> you know, and if it was a little uncomfortable for you, that's okay, too. Because we um, oftentimes have to sit in discomfort. I, I tell people all the time when I go into a place, just think about it. You may be uncomfortable with what I'm going to say, but this is a black girl on a stage in a predominantly white space having to say some things. And that I really shouldn't have to say, but I'm having to say it. So who's really uncomfortable, you know? Mm. And so let's just really think about that. So, you know, I hope you sit in that. And I think a great practice when you hear stuff um, is to really say, what what may God be trying to get me to hear, Mm. you know? And just if we do if we do that pause, you know, sometimes that pause would begin to speak to us, um, you know, when we pause. But sometimes we quick to 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 say something. So we try to treat people, um, teach people and be the bridge is to really listen. Just the discipline of listening and learning. Um, You know, did you Google that before you asked me? You know, (laughs) Did you, did you read a book before you asked me that question? You know, so um, I'm so excited about all that is happening in, in your life and just to see um, you be fully yourself um, in this. I'm telling you, if I if we just go if we go back to like 2014 and we just oh think goodness. through what God has done and where God has brought us, like it's just amazing. I'm always in awe, like, wow. Uh, because I know it's God. Because it's definitely not me. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it's definitely exactly. Is you know, so you continue to keep up the good work. So thank you. Go to the donors table if you'd like to hear the unedited version of this podcast. Thanks for listening to the Be the Bridge podcast. To find out more about the Be the Bridge organization and/or to become a bridge builder in your community, go to be the bridge.com. Again. That's be the bridge.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to rate and review it on this platform and share it with as many people as you possibly can. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's show was edited, recorded, and produced by Trayvon Potts at Integrated Entertainment Studios in Metro Atlanta, Georgia. The host and executive producer is Latasha Morrison. Lauren C. Brown is the senior producer. And transcribed by Sarah Conitzer. Please join us next time. This has been a Be The Bridge production.